Genshin Impact, lauded as both an amazing game, in fact the breakout hit of 2020 for many people, but it's tainted by its nature as a gotcha. Is the game truly worthy of praise, or is its remaining player base stuck in the dopamine rush of chasing the next pretty character? Well, I'll be going over the good, the bad, and the ugly of Genshin Impact's every detail before finally giving my verdict on the game. And yes, full disclosure, my channel does host dozens of Genshin Impact videos, but, well, there's a lot to say, so you can judge my impartiality or lack thereof yourself. The World Firstly, to give background to the game, I will go over the essentials of the world while avoiding spoilers as best I can throughout. There will be a few. Players traverse the realm of Tivart, a land full of mysteries to uncover and powerful foes to fell. Each region is governed by an Archon, essentially a being akin to a god, and each of these is associated with one of seven elements. So far we have explored Monster with the Animo Archon, Liyue with Geo, and recently Inazuma with Electro. Besides that, Pyro, Cryo, Hydro, and Dendro make up the elements that each playable character is associated with. The player takes the role of a traveller new to these lands and explores the people and places therein, playing out the usual outsider isekai trope that lets you find out about the world at the same time as the traveller. The Good Gameplay Loop Part A Remember that emphasis on Part A, that's important. The gameplay loop is the most essential part of any game. It's the part that sets gaming apart from any other form of media. Most games have a standard gameplay loop that's expected to be enjoyable by the player and Genshin Impact is split into three main parts with some caveats. The first is exploration. The world of Genshin Impact is for the new player full of mysteries to uncover and wonderful sights to behold. Once past the tutorial, you can choose a direction and delve into the unknown, finding plentiful goodies and distractions at every turn. It is entirely open-ended and, I think, Genshin Impact at its best. The world has so many different things to interact with, secrets to uncover, and nothing comes close to this exploratory section of the game. A silky might guide you to a chest, an enemy camp may require uprooting, or you may even encounter a new character that gives you a quest, and these quests form the second loop. They are a much more structured set of interactions throughout the world, which see you go to particular places and do specific objectives like, you know, any other game. These can be grand quests involving the game's main story and characters, or minor interactions with regular NPCs that are unlikely to show up again but still leave their mark on your memory. This will frequently involve combat, but exploration or character development take an equal role. More on these later. And the third gameplay loop I will for now refer to as Gacha. While relatively shrouded for your first several dozen hours of gameplay, once you reach endgame a different gameplay loop forms that Let's say I won't be talking about much in the good section of this video. The first two gameplay loops are, however, very satisfying. And if you ignore the gacha entirely, which you can do in theory, there is still more content than a standard $60 gaming release available for free in Genshin Impact right now. And this is only going to grow every six weeks as new patches come out. Beyond this, more or less every week there's a new kind of event which looks to shake up this gameplay loop for better or for worse, but we'll come on to those later. Characters Genshin Impact, in less than a year since its release, has already amassed several dozen playable characters, and these are one of the game's biggest strengths. Each character conveys their personality as you play them, reacting to changes in the weather, environment, or simply telling you to stop procrastinating if you leave the game open in the background. Not procrastinating. The wide range of characters means it's very easy to find someone to latch onto who shares characteristics you enjoy. Take Zhongli. He appears to be a simple employee of a local funeral parlour with a penchant for history. He has a large role in the story that gives the player a lot of reasons to like him that I won't spoil, and these contribute to him being one of my favourite characters just for all of the screen time he gets. And on the other hand, a character like Xin Yan has yet to see an appearance in the game beyond being playable, but has just as much to like, entirely explored through her gameplay, and the snippets of story you can find through her description. Cynically, it's clear to see why the game has so many well-developed characters. It is a gotcha. And indeed, most of these likeable characters are locked behind a paywall that requires purchase. Luck or patience might get you there, but obviously your wallet is the most surefire way. The game is actively encouraged to make characters you love in an attempt to persuade your loyalty to extend to your wallet. The gacha elements will be criticised later on, but the fact remains that it encourages Mahoyo to make a better cast of characters and the results show. It's a very memorable cast, 
more than most games I've played in recent memory. What's more, each party contains four characters playable at once, so you really get plenty of opportunities to use your favourites. Now, if only playable characters were interesting, these intentions would be quite clearly aimed at your wallet, but the game packs hundreds of characters that clearly will never be playable, but pack just as much charm as your Zhongli or Kaching. While you explore the world and perform quests, you will find various NPCs to be unique and fascinating in themselves, whether it be a suspiciously knowledgeable youth attempting to communicate with Hillichelds, the game's most common enemies, or a child trapped in an adult's body desperately wishing to meet their parents once more. Getting to meet the inhabitants of Tevat is as much of a draw as anything else, and you would be remiss not to talk to almost everyone you meet, lest you miss a charming little tale. Story and World Building The story of Genshin Impact consists of both the macro and the micro. The macro story is a tale of siblings separated by an unknown god, and the quest to reunite once more for exploring all the regions of Tevat. The player gets involved in the intrigue of each nation, and a potentially promising story is yet to unfold. The game is still in its infancy in the overall story, and I expect the big payoffs will take years to arrive, meaning only time will tell how these go. However, the world building of Tevat on a larger scale has me sold. I won't spoil whom they are, but the gods of this world walk among mortals, unknown to the majority of passers-by in some regions, and worshipped as deities in others. We see them act in vastly different ways. For some, through their actions and not their divine power, they shape the future of their respective territories throughout the story, before returning to their travels as any layman would. Others seek to control their nation with power and authority by force, to varying degrees of success. The representation of the divine in Genshin Impact is one area I have fallen in love with and most look forward to seeing how this develops as we move through the regions. In fact, the word Genshin can be read in the original Chinese as either original god or candidate god, depending on who you ask. This means the name of the game can be interpreted in English as the story resulting the impact of the original gods, which, as the story unfolds, looks more and more relevant by patch. The new region in Azuma already marks a sharp divide between what we've seen before, and this has me excited for more. Beyond this, the world tells its story in a hundred ways, from following along with gripping main story quests, to literally exploring the world and making discoveries about the land you tread as you go. Exploration Getting around the world of Genshin Impact is a breeze, if you have venti. The main boon of exploration in Genshin Impact is that 99.99% of surfaces are climbable, meaning once you complete the tutorial, more or less the entire world is accessible to you right away. Alongside this, you can glide at will for a very long time, giving you the freedom to explore in any direction with ease. This, naturally, is why the game was heavily compared to Breath of the Wild on release, and I only see this as a compliment. Truthfully, it's the reason I picked the game up in the first place and it exceeds Breath of the Wild in one main area. Rain doesn't make climbing impossible. 10 out of 10, best game ever, end of video. That's a joke, we'll get on to that, but it still beats Breath of the Wild there. Now, exploration isn't perfect, as some areas may require certain elements to unlock, but unless you're on a Nuzlocke like me, the game gives you a character of each element for free, meaning there's no obstacles to exploring based on your luck with the Garcha. The main character can switch between the elements of Animo and Geo by visiting the Statue of the Seven dotted around the world, and while this does give you access to everything you need to explore, it means if your traveller currently has an Animo affiliation but you need Geo to unlock a zone, it can be a lengthy trip back to change your power, meaning I'd often just mark it on the map rather than make the journey. Other than this blip, exploring is my favourite part of Genshin Impact, and as you unlock more characters, this becomes a non-issue. Indeed, while many would focus on new characters for their story or combat presence, their out-of-combat utility is something I enjoy profusely myself. However, the most useful of these abilities are the rarest, with characters like Kaching able to teleport to high spaces at whim, Benji conjuring a gust of wind to fly, or Mona being able to walk across water. These are, of course, the rarest characters to get. If you get lucky on the Garcha, or spend money, you can have a more pleasurable exploration experience, which is of dubious merit. The Traveller can at least place these down for free, so you can experience a glimmer of this joy for free. But this is one area where a bit of luck can change your game profusely. But even if you just had the free characters, it doesn't diminish the absolutely full map with rewards at every corner. It's a great feeling to look around and see rewards in every direction or interesting paths to explore. It makes the release of a new region make Genshin feel like a new game once more, and the release of Inazuma has reignited a good chunk of what I love about the game. Graphics. Genshin Impact is a beautiful game, wherever you play it. I've played in 4K since day one, and the amount of pictures I have saved from my rotating desktop speaks volumes. 
Truly though, even on mobile it looks better than I imagined a game really could a few years ago. While the anime inspired looks may not be for everyone, nobody can refute how beautiful a sunset over Liyue Harbour looks. I think there's precious little I need to say about the graphics, as you'll see about an hour of them over the course of this video. There's no low res textures that pop out or any annoying fading in enemies. Ancient is a joy to walk around in, take pictures and explore just to see the sights. And the cutscenes can bring that to life even more. Combat. Combat is one of Genshin's crowning achievements, given what the genre is trying to achieve. And the crux of it will be familiar to any MOBA player. You have your basic attacks, one skill, and an ultimate which the former two charge up. This is all well and good, but the strength comes as the party is a size of four, meaning you get all these options for four characters at any given time. As a gacha, Mahoyo naturally wants you to have a good reason to pull for as many characters as possible, and the combat system is a great reward for that. Every party member plays differently, can contribute different things to your party. As of the writing of this script, there were 37 characters, making for a possible combination of 66,045 teams, each of which may have a genuine use as a combination depending upon the content at hand. Part of the enjoyment for each encounter is preparing your optimum team for each fight, as different elements will perform better against different enemies, as well as each element combining with others for unique effects. Combine Pyro with Hydra for a huge boost in damage, or combine Evil with Geo for a shield that protects you. Most of these decisions are made during team building, but they can apply on the flying combat as well. However, it is worth noting that not having the right element for a combat scenario won't leave you just unable to participate. It means you will perform worse, but you can still play as long as you don't have like a whole party of Hydro characters against a Hydro monster. And once we get into combat, it's fast paced, frantic and flashy. With most teams, you will change between characters every few seconds to utilize their various skills whenever they come off cooldown, leading into their flashy elemental bursts. The five star characters and Barbara will have beautiful cutaways from combat for a second while they perform their ultimate attack. You can expect to see these very often, sometimes multiple times in the same combat. And despite having seen Kaching do this particular pose thousands of times, it still doesn't get old. They are so well crafted and just short enough they don't take you away from the action, but draw you further into it despite seeing them so much. The 4 star characters don't have these flashy animations, but you still have something unique to show that keeps the battlefield fresh even hundreds of hours in as you discover the complexities of the system at hand. Battles at the highest level are often a race to string together as many elemental bursts as quickly as possible, making sure the balanced usage of your characters and hit their cooldowns for maximum efficiency. But it's not the only way to play or approach a puzzle. Some enemies call for different responses based on your team, such as the Abyss Hells that I enjoy just running around and shooting for a bit. Or you could forgo all that entirely and try to assemble a combo that does the most damage possible. The quick swapping between four unique characters makes Genshin feel truly unique all these hours in and makes getting a new character not only unlock their own options, but the possibilities of which dozens of team combinations they can affect as well. However, while the combat in isolation is great, it does have its fair share of problems when we shift to reality that I'll cover later on. Content Gacha games are known for their constant swathes of content, required to keep the player invested on a regular basis. Genshin releases a new content patch every six weeks that generally represents a major update. Some of these are truly massive in scale, such as 1.2 and 1.6, which brought entirely new areas to explore, which frankly would merit being a paid DLC in a regular game. And 2.0, being the most recent update, had enough content to be a game by itself. Others are more middling, such as seasonal events with a few mini games and rewards to earn, as well as additional challenges every week, which may range from a simple wandering merchant with a few easy quests to do to a fully fledged boss rush that challenges even the most veteran of players. Or just something completely off the rails, like this on screen is a fully fledged tower defense mode in the game, which they really don't care about trying new things. Some gacha games may slap together some new levels, add a new two day portrait with a fancy animation and call it a day, but Frankly, the amount of content Genshin produces every six weeks makes me concerned for the team's well-being, considering they're working on the next big region alongside all this. Fingers crossed they're all doing okay, and we haven't heard anything to suggest otherwise, so I just assume they have a really massive team that is putting their all into this and reaping the rewards. Some of this content is described only as filler, which is what a usual gacha game may produce, but I'm happy to say Genshin goes the extra mile here. Not many games can boast having meaningfully unique content every six weeks, and Genshin delivers. 
quests. Gacha games and even RPGs in general can fall victim to a generally uninteresting set of quests beyond the main story, looking to fill time and not do much else. Genshin does have its fair share of these, mostly in the daily commissions to earn in-game currency, but so far as real quests goes, Genshin certainly demolishes any gacha I've played and several fully priced RPGs. The main story is detailed in Archon quests which have all the bravado and intrigue of a AAA title. The climax of each Archon's arc so far have been truly gripping experiences that draw you further into the game and leave you on the edge of your seat. However, just as strong as the main storyline, the quests not directly linked to them. Most of the playable characters have a story quest where you follow them down a story not related to the main plot, but more personal to them. My favourite being Sing Xiao's search for a copy of a rare last volume to the book he's reading. Which you get to read afterwards, by the way, and it asks some very interesting questions that mean I can't wait for these two characters to meet. But even beyond that, dozens more small quests fall into two broad camps. One delves deep into exploring the world, such as discovering a puzzle beyond a far off island. The other sees us interacting with a minor character in the world just to learn their story and leave them be. Most memorable to many players will be finding a full grown adult abandoned as a child playing hide and seek as his parents told him before he left. And now he's an adult and he's been hiding this whole time. You feel sorry for him and his plight in his little corner of the world and Genshin is full of quests just like these. My favourite game of all time, Xenoblade Chronicles, maybe has a dozen side quests I'd say are truly worth it. I don't know if Genshin has a dozen, I'd suggest missing out on. The Abyss. The Abyss is the good side of the endgame in Genshin Impact. It's a gauntlet of increasingly challenging enemies in a time trial format for you to test your skill against. It has 12 floors, 8 of which are a sort of warm up for you to progress with alongside the main game with one time rewards, whereas the last 4 floors refresh every 2 weeks with new rewards. These last 4 floors change at every new patch and represent the main reason for you to power up your characters. The fact that each patch we mostly get refreshes to these final four floors make them genuinely worth doing as you only have to beat each set of enemies a few times before a new patch appears and the challenge changes. The upper echelons definitely invoke a sense of pay to win, as with most gachas, the big spenders can defeat even the deepest challenges with relative ease. However, this is also attainable for the majority of players with a bit of work and these aren't whale only events. Personally, I get a score of 35 out of 36 consistently, not quite top marks, but for a low spender, I'm more than happy with this reward for the challenge. Variety of events. While combat, cutscenes and exploration make up the bulk of the gameplay, credit must be given to the sheer variety of seasonal events that change this all around. We've seen fully fledged hide and seek games, tower defense modes, cooperative beach volleyball. The team at Mahoya has no qualms of trying out new things with their system. None of these would make a game by themselves, but it's a nice touch to have alongside everything else. Even the core gameplay has some unusual divergences, such as the hangout events, which see you take part in a little story with multiple endings visual novel style, with characters that don't feature heavily in the main story. Most of the time, the core gameplay loop will do what it does, but these extra little bits can be a nice distraction. Between good and bad. The Inazuma Arc. Warning, this section spoils the events of the Inazuma arc. If you want to avoid spoilers, skip to the timestamp on screen now. I try to avoid spoilers elsewhere in this overview, but it's not possible for this section. The Inazuma arc had a lot of high points. We finally sneak onto this island after a year of waiting, and we get introduced to Ayaka and her wonderful dance among the forest. Every interaction with the Raiden Shogun is a joy. In particular, the moment Sarah started to run for the Shogun, the moment our fight with her ends is an intense stream of epic moment to epic moment with twists abound. However, even within this scene, we have a glaring problem, and everything around this event that was required to make it happen so early are dubious at best. Pacing throughout the main story has been a strength of Genshin Impact. The main story quests have felt leisurely at times, with Zhongli happy to gallivant around Liyue buying flowers for himself despite knowing of the imminent threat that proves costly to his nation. Yet, when we come to Inazuma, we find ourselves thrust into a war that promises to be a long conflict. We sign up for the resistance and lay the groundwork for a fight to last us through months of patches as we constantly push back against the Shogunate. Then the Hoyo goes, how about we wrap this up in six weeks instead? It's as silly as it sounds. While playing through the Archon Quest for 2.1, I found myself engrossed in joining the resistance and discovering the involvement of delusions. 
I was ready to invade the Fatui's lair on Inazuma in response. Then once we get there and trouble strikes, this fox shows up and Deus Ex Machina's us out of there. We follow along with her plans and arrive at the palace for one of the most engrossing and hyped 15 minutes of gameplay Genshin has to offer. A tough fight with Signora that leads to her being totally obliterated also leaves the Traveller literally glitching out, fearful of what they've witnessed. This gave me chills. I look forward to seeing if this glitchy texture was just a neat visual effect or if it might link to any of Scaramouche's theories from 1.1. This camera angle is worthy of an Archon and gave me further chills. Then the Vision Reawakening was an epic moment. It raises the question as to whether people could wield two Visions for additional power to combat the damage of delusions. Indeed, two Visions was enough to deflect a blow that killed Signora after all. But everything that is involved in making the scene happen makes no sense. When we met the Resistance, they were struggling to keep a foothold without our assistance multiple islands away from the capital. Last we left them, the consequences of delusions had left the camps in disarray. But a few short days later, a faction of them have managed to storm the palace? How did they cover so much ground? What did we miss? Hazaha's moment was inspiring enough that I might just let that slide just so that we get to see it. But that's not all. As you see... Then the story concludes. We suddenly persuade the Shogun to change her ways. Vision Hunt Degree, gone in six weeks. I take no particular issue with this event by itself, but to be past the climax after just six weeks is a little underwhelming and renders the entire Rebellion arc feeling rather useless. Sorry, Kikomi. But then even further, how this arc dealt with Ai's Gnosis is insulting. See, a Gnosis in Genshin Impact is very important. This singular chess piece essentially is what denotes you as a Archon, as a god, and connects you to Celestia. The Gnosis of Venti and Zhongli respectively were key, exciting moments in their storyline. When we see Venti stolen, it gives us real cause to fear the Fatui's power and learn of their importance in the world, beyond just being annoying diplomats up to that point. Then we see Zhongli negotiate to part with his under a very complex scheme, and we're left piecing together what it means for Liyue. Both memorable moments that mean a lot for the story. I do not give it for free. But in Azuma, this moment is mentioned offhand as a bit of spoken dialogue at the end of the arc, not so much as giving the time of day as screen time. What's wrong? I handed that over. You did what now? We could take this as a showing of just how little importance it had to the Shogun, but not even getting to hear this from the Shogun herself leaves a sour taste in my mouth. Then, a few sentences after this bombshell, we are told, I think it would be easiest for you to go to Sumeru. What now? If you played the story on the day of release, the time between entering Inazuma and being told we can leave are just six weeks. The time between region releases is one whole year. Dropping this so soon has me concerned for what we have planned to do for the next entire year. To be fair, the Liyue arc was wrapped up six weeks after the game's release as well, but that made sense. We had a whole game's worth of content before that, and the first patch wrapped up the story. Plus, Inazuma's entire plot was about the Sokoku degree closing the borders, but it made sense we had to build our connections to find a way into the closed-off region. Sumeru has no such restriction. Entering should be as easy as just walking across the map. I can give Mahoyo the benefit of the doubt that they may yet surprise us with a year full of meaningful content to bide our time for Sumeru's release. The year's worth of Archon content leading up to Inazuma was satisfying for the most part. The saving grace for Inazuma lies with the story quest with Eye that becomes available after the main story, as it's full to the brim of charm, character development, and well paced intrigue. I will challenge you, Almighty Shogun. I never expected to hear Ai's opinion on disastrously long light novel titles. The good thing about being reincarnated as a hilly churl is that I only need to eat sunsetias to become stronger. It's so long. And seeing her interact with the general public was a delight. Then the climax shows her calm, exploratory demeanor shift to that of a ruler befitting of eternity. Anyone who can beat me in a duel becomes the new commissioner. 
player can see firsthand her desires in a way that makes a lot more sense than the main story. This quest shows Mahoyo clearly knows how to weave a good tale. And thankfully, to my disappointment with the Archon quest and showed Mahoyo still has a great story left to tell. May this be a solitary blip in Genshin's pacing for years to come. Free to play. It is the game's blessing and its curse. It's just about one of the best games on the free to play market that you don't need to put a penny into to enjoy the majority of the gameplay. Exploring, fighting, questing, all free, with an in-depth story and a beautiful world. Free to play lowers the barrier for entry and makes this game accessible to anyone. And the gacha even has a single benefit. Unlike some other gacha games I've played, there's no one set of characters or events or medals that are required in order to experience the content. You genuinely get a choice of choosing who you want to play or who you get and getting a different gameplay experience than everyone else has got before you. In giving you a wide variety of characters that you can just randomly get, every person will explore the world in a different way with different tools, making the gameplay even more unique. But it comes with its downsides that, well, we're about to get onto those, but it's worth noting that Gacha isn't all downside. Free makes this game accessible to players who might not ordinarily be able to afford a $60 game, and it is a gem for these players, regardless of reason. However, if you can't afford a $60 game, Getting a gacha game is a very dangerous approach to an incredibly slippery slope. This means I can mark free to play as neither a positive nor negative as it depends heavily on the individual person if this is going to be something you can just accept as in the game, bear in mind and move on, or if you're even remotely at risk of it taking over. And pause the video. If you are even remotely likely to give in to gambling tendencies or anything that the gacha game preys on, do not play this game. The bad. Core gameplay loop, part B. Genshin Impact has two gameplay loops. It has the one I've spoken about so far. Exploration, finding chests, beating new bosses, everything so exciting and new, and then it stops. This is the point where in a usual game, you'd put it down and leave it. Maybe come back for the next content patch or DLC at best. Take, say, New Automata. Fantastic game, I explored the world, beat the main story, did the side quests I wanted to, and put it down satisfied after 30 hours or so. And I still listen to the soundtrack to this day. You should really go listen to it. I digress, I'll put it on in the background for a bit. Genshin Impact, in theory, has this game mode. If you just did the Archon and Story Quest, explored, and cared little for the gacha elements, you'd have a blast. Smash out all the fun content, until the non-gacha elements are done, then wait for the next region to be released a year later. This is not how I and many others play it, as we insist on an end game. We want more, we've grown to love these characters, we can't just shelve them and find something new. Indeed, there's a new character coming out that I want in three weeks, so to keep players interested, we need an end game, and boy does Mahoyo have one in store. As you level up characters, initially you need a scattering of resources, nothing you wouldn't find by exploring naturally. But as the levels go up, the requirements to do so go up exponentially. So once we get past the fun gameplay loop, we get into the gacha gameplay loop. Most resources in the game are locked behind resin or primer gems. You might not recognize those words yet from this video as I haven't needed to say them yet. But these are the two words that define the gacha elements of the game and well, it's all downhill from here. Primer gems are the premium currency, allowing you to earn new items and new characters power up existing characters, you use resin. Your experience, your gold, your level up materials, your equipment, it's a resin based economy. You get 160 at max and that takes about a day to recharge. Or you can buy recharges of course like any gacha game would. It takes about 20 resin to take a character from level 1 to 20 with the cap being 90. Not much but note the experience from killing monsters this would require is about 6,000 kills. And fine with not being incentivized to spend all day grinding killing monsters, the experience is so pitifully low it may as well not exist. It's then about 60 resin for the next 20 levels. Sure, that seems fine, we get 160 a day. But when we reach high levels, to fully farm a single character, it takes 3,240 resin. This is about 20 days worth of dedication and waiting for one character before the RNG truly sets in with artifacts that, well, I'll get into that later. And that's repeatedly beating the same enemies or dungeons over and over for about 8 actual hours of real time. 
Even in the event that you get a new flashy character in the end game, you're still not going to be able to really use them for at least 20 days if you haven't prepared ahead. And that is crazy talk. You want to be excited about this new thing you've got, but it's just left on the shelf. The exploration and excitement that once belonged to Genshin Impact is long gone. You enter the dungeon or find the enemy in the open world, defeat them five times, collect your rewards and log off of the day. And that is the gameplay loop. Once your resin runs out, there are four basic and mostly forgettable quests to earn you 60 primary gems a day. You can farm some resources such as enemy drops if you need them, but that's it. It's a grind. The same bosses over and over and over. I have defeated this particular domain's enemies more times than I've left my house since the pandemic. And that's sadly not a joke. There are so many problems here. I will admit one is with the player base, myself included in part. I think expecting a game with this much content to also have a satisfying end game takes away from the focus of what makes Genshin so great. If everyone just smashed out the good content and left the game for the next content patch, we'd all have more fun. But under the free to play model, Genshin would probably close down by the next patch if we all did that. So it needs to keep us going. And this is how it does so. See, Genshin transforms from this full game full of life to a bog standard gacha at this point. It literally feels like a different game that happens to share combat mechanics. The world is no longer full of life, but once it's empty, there's very little for you to do there, except go from point A to B to earn your little smatterings of currency of whatever you choose to grind that day. And the grind is eternal, and the resin recharge is slow. Now, personally, I don't mind this. I think it gives you a bit to do each day, and I don't want to spend hours grinding these materials. In a way, the end game forces you to have a life outside the game, so I like that the game puts a stopgap on it. And it's important to note this doesn't apply to the story or exploration, none of these require resin. The best parts of the game you can more or less just go and do whatever you want with nothing getting in the way. And mostly the grind is unnecessary for all but the abyss and some weekly events. The main story, exploration, and just about all the fun stuff can be done by a character of any power level thanks to a good scaling mechanic. But this gameplay loop is nonetheless part of the game, as Mahoyo needs to keep players on every week so they can be excited for the next character. A lot of gacha games will stop your progress behind this kind of daily counter, whereas in Genshin it's only the grinding that's limited, so this is better than some of the competitors at the very least. But then we get onto artifacts. The most RNG endgame system I've ever seen, and I rated on WoW. Okay, here's how it works, and it's as ridiculous as it sounds. You choose a dungeon to farm, and you can get about 10 artifacts a day on average. First, you get one of two artifacts from the dungeon. Is it the one you want? Great. Now it's in one of five random slots. Then it comes with a random stat. Then it has four random substats. Of all of those substats, ones you want, or at the very least you could live with, no. Then you throw the artifact out and start again and do this again and again and again until you get one that looks promising. Now you need to level it up and each time you level it up four times, one of these random sets will get a bonus. This could be one you wanted, could be one you didn't. And then you have to do this until level 20 over and over again. By the time you get to the end of this process, you have had to go through so many layers of RNG that it makes it practically impossible to get a perfect artifact. And it can feel better and more lucky to get a good artifact in the end game than to get the rarest characters. And this is, of course, on purpose, so that the grind never ends. You always have a reason to log in and try to improve your artifacts. Maybe you settle for good artifacts, but what if today your luck gives you a better one? So you log on. This is the gacha gameplay Genshin leaves behind once all the good content is dried up. And I do it because I'm in franchise and I want to see those numbers go up. So I accept it. Log in daily and do my grind. But is it fun? Or do I just like those numbers? It's much closer to the latter. Oh, and of course for everything but the artifact grind, you can pay to skip it. The battle pass gives you lots of more and experience books that reduce the need to grind. I have paid to skip the grind a few times just to save myself the time in my life, not the resin. So the system they designed for endgame to keep logging in and earning opportunities to spend money is working as intended. Forced content. Genshin Impact has a definitive mix of content on offer when it comes to the weekly events. Some of these are fun, even the majority of them I would call good as I've hailed in the first part of this video. Fun side diversions are not taking up too much time, but if a particular event isn't one you enjoy or is just downright bad, 
The game's economy encourages you to play through it anyway for the limited Primer Gems. If you don't do the events, you get basically none of these. You get 60 a day, and it costs 15,000 to guarantee a 5-star character, so go figure, you do the event. This, along with the core gameplay loop of boring items I've just discussed, amounts to what I call Netflix bait, or YouTuber bait, or whatever. Outside of new quests, a few challenges, and the abyss, most of the content the game dishes out as an end game is something I begrudgingly turn to while watching something on Netflix or YouTube to stay sane at the same time. I don't think this takes away from the game's strengths, and I could choose to ignore all this content if I wanted, but then I'd never have a practical chance at a new character ever again, so the game takes its grasp on your psychology to want new shiny things and you play them. However, as I've noted earlier, a lot of these events are actually cute or fun distractions, but the amount of times you need to repeat them for rewards often makes them feel like they've overstayed their welcome. Game Balance While combat looks great with the flashy bursts, the balance behind that combat leaves a lot to be desired. The game does not at least have any competitive PvP element, the lack of game balance isn't backbreaking, but does limit the player's effective choices for high level content for no real reason. Certain elements, namely Electro, are shafted in terms of damage output for little tangible benefit. We have seen minor buffs in one content patch, but the king of DPS is still the Pyro Hydro combination for, again, no real reason. Take, for example, my Kaching, this is my Hu Tao. My Kaching is my pride and joy that I got on my first week of the game. I put more resources into powering her up than any other character. Hu Tao, on the other hand, I have done the bare minimum to make competent. She doesn't have anywhere near perfect artifacts, and her talents are underleveled. Pair them both with Sing Xiao for the reactions, and they both kill a Ruin Guard in about the same time. Except Hu Tao didn't even need her elemental burst. Because Kaching is my favourite character, I have put the work in to make her almost as good as a medium Hu Tao. And any character can be made competitive this way. People have enjoyed putting healers into damaging roles. The amount of damage barbers I've seen is insane. But it just puts you on the back foot from the word go. Beyond this, several new characters also release with underwhelming kits that stem from flaws in the game's design itself. For example, Yoimiya's design problems can be said for most Archer characters. The basic attack string is majorly single target focused and they can just miss. Other archers have abilities that make up for this. For example, Venti's skill and burst are more than enough to justify him on your team. Yoimiya's skill is to boost her regular attack damage. So she's all about those attacks that can just miss. Yomiya still has encounters where she shines, but the community has not been quiet about their discontent with character designs, and for good reason, with the Raiden Shogun being the latest casualty. For people invested into these characters for their story or aesthetic, it's a real shame their viability in the late game is stifled. Early game, you won't notice any of this too much, but it really comes into itself the more gacha the game gets. And this isn't about power creep, which gacha games are bound to encounter at some point. These are the newly released characters, is seeing more and more issues just like this. But only once in the game's first year has this been addressed in any major way, with Zhongli's buff from what people saw as underwhelming to borderline broken. Here's hoping this tune changes as the years roll on, so the characters aren't left to dust. The Ugly Gacha Addiction The mere fact that this game is a gacha means that most people should hesitate before picking it up. And for those of you inclined towards any addictive compulsion, you might not be able to help. Steer clear. I cannot say this clearly enough. Under no circumstances play this game if you think you might get addicted and pull out your wallet. As a game at its core, Genshin has so much potential, but this is squandered with the gacha system. It's not totally bad for the game. Like I've said, having a variety of characters that people can play at random can be good. I like that it gives a unique gameplay experience to the player to unlock characters in different orders and formulate different parties and strategies. This is a plus. In a game like Xenoblade Chronicles 2, we see this system in full use. It's a single player game with a full on gacha system, giving you different characters on every playthrough, but it's a $60 game. You buy it and can gamble in game to your heart's content for free. Just play through the game and you get more pulls than you need, unless you want Cosmos, but that's not what this video is about. But Genshin does not go this route, and of course is made actively worse for it. When I decided to purchase the Battle of Pass to avoid grinding through more content I didn't want to do, 
aka to avoid playing the game, it was clear that the money dictates even the gameplay elements, never mind wishing for new characters. Wishing. The word used in Genshin for when you exchange premium currency for a 0.6% chance at the latest fancy character. Through free currency alone, you can earn up to one guaranteed 5 star character about every 3 months at worst. For free? This would be a reasonable rate, meaning if you can avoid temptation for a few months, the character that you've looked forward to can be yours. However, when you reach this point, it's still just a 50% chance of who you want. The other 50% is one of 5 set characters that haven't changed since release. The 50-50 turns that long wait for a free to play player into ash which heavily debilitates the value of the banners and makes saving for one particular character a gargantuan effort. Indeed, I have made videos of my own desperate calculations in the past before, where I worked out with just one Welkin Moon purchase of £5, I can afford it. Others have not been so lucky, and I've seen spending in the hundreds or thousands, or I dare say, even higher. For full disclosure, I have spent £55 in this game. This would be about 70, 80 US dollars. I am happy with these purchases, and that means I've spent about as much money on Genshin as any brand new game I'd purchase nowadays plus DLC. I have bought the Battle Pass three times, mostly to save my time, and Welcome Moon twice in an attempt to pull a 5 star I wanted. It's not cheap, but given the amount of fun I have got from the game, I'm content with these purchases. And indeed, if spending $200 on Zhongli makes you happy, and it is truly worth it, and you can truly afford it, then go for it. The dark side comes through for those who are not so lucky. Those who spend thousands of dollars they may or may not have for a chance at a character. It often isn't the millionaires of the world that are wailing by spending thousands of dollars to get new characters, but regular people who have problems with addiction the game exploits to, in some cases, force them into debt or worse. You want to know how much it'll cost you to get a fully powered up new character and their weapon, of course, fully powered up? You'd need an astounding $4,871 if you have the worst possible luck. The possibility of this game literally ruining people's lives is one that most games of this caliber don't come close to facing. Imagine if playing Breath of the Wild costs someone their house. It's unheard of, it'd be insane, but some gacha players aren't so lucky. To top it off, I ran a poll on my channel and over 50% of respondents said Genshin was an addiction compared to 25% a video game. This may be a meme in the community to some extent, but it isn't a healthy one. One particular comment from a respondent really highlights this. Genshin Impact is a game that I shouldn't have heard of and regret wasting hours of my life on. Let's go away from that for a moment. Let's imagine Genshin was a regular $60 game. We've seen in the first hour of gameplay just how this game could work without Garcha. Do a quest for Lisa, you unlock her. Same for Amber and Kaya, and then, of course, it just stops. What if completing a character's individual story quest unlocked them? As a reward for finding Xingxiao's desired book, we get to play him. Defeating Child, he joins our party. Or completing the Archon quest and defeating Storm Terror adds Venti to our party to fight by our side. Ready built into the gameplay is a way of making it incredibly engaging to unlock new characters without the need for a gacha system. Add yearly $30 DLC for a new region, and I'd be happy to pick up Genshin, exhaust its gameplay, and come back next year. I've appreciated the gameplay over the last year past the initial point more for what I can make for this channel and the events I've streamed than for the gameplay itself. So you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna pull. Here's Raiden for you, right now! <laughs> Well, I wasn't lying. What if to ascend Kishring, instead of having to beat monsters the old-fashioned way again and again and again, you had to face an increasingly powerful electro hypostasis with new mechanics every ascension? It's easy to convert this game into an amazing A-plus experience, but it's a gacha, so we suffer from it. I think we all know that any hopes of this is but a fleeting fantasy. How long will I keep playing Genshin Impact for? It might seem like I've ended on quite the downer, but... That's natural for the good, the bad, and the ugly sections. Genshin is not a perfect game, and it would be much closer to one without gacha ties dragging it down. But here's the thing. There probably isn't a world where that game can exist. The game, without a doubt, is best experienced on console or PC with better graphics and easier controls, 
that excluding the mobile market leaves Genshin without the player base to support the scale of the project Mahoyo set out to do. The mobile market would be incredibly hostile to a $60 game, and any amount of quality would not make up for the price tag it justifies to that market. And so, instead, it blends into the existing mould, but stands out as frankly the best gacha game I've seen, and I expect 100 imitations to be in production as I write this script. I can tell that my patience for the gacha guide is withering, and the day may soon come when spending my resin is optional when I only do the fun events, but so far as quitting entirely? No. Inazuma just launched and reignited my love for this game with all the things to see, to explore, and the intricate unfolding story with as many lovable characters as there are, well, characters. Once I've exhausted its content, I could see stepping back, reserving gameplay to streaming, as I found that sharing my weekly grinds is genuinely more enjoyable than just doing it by itself. But beyond that, I see Genshin as part of my life for years to come, but whether that's as a daily grind or just to play once per patch remains to be seen. Longevity. This falls in neither the good, the bad, nor the ugly camp as of yet, but it's too important a factor to not consider on the game's anniversary. Longevity is a key component when deciding to play any gacha game. It is the fate of them all that, after the traveler's journey is over, the game will shut down. All those characters, all those purchases may be playable no more, visible only through videos such as this. The first gacha game I got invested into, Kingdom Hearts Union Cross, recently closed its doors. Genshin Impact at least has a large roadmap in place and the popularity plus financial support to see that through. I have no doubt the game will still be going in 5 years time, which means if you do decide to spend a bit for that next character, you will get use of it for years to come. What happens at the end of the game's lifespan is anybody's guess at this point. I doubt even Mahoyo has a plan that far into the future. We can hope Mahoyo ends the game to run with an offline mode to let us experience to that forever more, but the chance remains that with the siblings united, all our time and effort will be erased. So do consider, if you spend $200 for the next character, it may not be yours forever. Conclusion I hope that if I've done my job well, this video should have left you with your own impression of the game, regardless if you've played it yet or not. Maybe this review is the deciding factor in making you want to play, maybe you're an existing player seeking affirmation, or maybe you wanted to understand a friend's strange obsession with this game. In the end, Garcha is a genre that isn't going anywhere anytime soon without some governmental intervention. It's a business model that, for better or worse, works. Given that is the truth, Genshin Impact takes this genre and sets a new bar for games to follow. How high this bar was set to previously is a separate discussion, but I can confidently recommend the first few dozen hours of Genshin Impact to anyone, with the largest asterisk in the world that if you have even a hint you might grow addicted to the gacha, that means it's all not worth it. And the end game simply isn't worth it by itself, the game just counts on you being enfranchised enough to bear with it at this point. But despite all those negatives, Genshin truly helped me get through this pandemic. It was an escapist dream with its massive world to explore, almost bringing me back to my first days with Breath of the Wild. Its lovable characters and interesting story have kept me coming back for more. Freedom, if demanded of you by an Archon, is really no freedom at all. I've spent money, but I know my limits. I may spend again if I can justify it, and I will keep playing. Genshin promises a new massive region to explore yearly, and if they all match Inazuma's content so far, I'll certainly be playing Genshin Impact into 2025 and beyond. There will come a day when the journey is over, and I will reflect on what's come. But for now, I look forward to discovering what lay in store for the citizens of Tivat. If you've enjoyed this video or found it useful, consider liking and subscribing for more content like this. I'm still planning to stream Genshin Impact weekly on Mondays on Twitch for the foreseeable future with other games featuring on Thursdays, so if you've enjoyed my style in this video, consider a follow and a look next time you're free to watch a stream. This is beyond the scope of anything I've produced so far, and if you've enjoyed watching to this point I'd appreciate knowing it was worth it from a comment down below, and that's genuinely not just for metrics or whatever. And if you have, thank you so much. At almost 8,500 words, I'm glad it was worth the effort if you've watched it all. Have a great day, and if you're still playing Genshin, best of luck in your next pull.